Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Sorry, I'm still not 100% this week, so uh, please bear with me and keep me in prayer. Um, so, uh, yeah, the title of the sermon I have today is uh, Find the Knowledge of God. Um, so, we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 2 as well as some other places uh, about some of the wonderful truths from the Word of God. And the main point I want to cover today is, of course, the wisdom of the Lord the word of the Lord and its importance in our lives. So if you want to turn to Proverbs chapter 2, we'll start in verse 1 of Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs 2, 1 reads, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto thy wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment, and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness, and judgment, and equity, yea, every good path. See, God's done everything he can to ensure that we have, that we can live life here, having the wisdom and knowledge of his ways, and the requirements he has to us to live by his statutes and commandments. And it's all for our benefit, which we'll find out. See, while the body of flesh, it can't be brought under subjection of the law, it can't be reformed, but it's so important that we have the knowledge of God through his word and the wisdom to apply it to our lives correctly. So um, we'll be in Colossians next. If you want to turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, I'll read from Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Colossians 1, 9 reads, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, the Lord wants us always increasing in knowledge of his word and being fruitful. And that's the walk that's pleasing unto him. See, he doesn't withhold anything for us. You know, when we choose to believe, we become sons of God. In the process, he, conf he begins conforming us to the image of his son. So you're there in Colossians 2, verse 2. It says that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See, there's no other source of wisdom and knowledge that we can find, but the treasure that's hid in God. And that's the word we can trust. That's the King James Bible uh, in the English language. That's our source of doctrine. That's our source of all truth and wisdom. Colossians 2.6 continues, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. That's what Brother Jason was saying this morning. You've got to have that foundation of Christ. Otherwise, everything that's established is false after that. It's got to be built on, on Christ and on his doctrine. In verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. See, we need to hold to those truths that we've learned from God. We need to hold on to the knowledge that he's given us through the reading of his word and through the preaching we hear from men of God, like this morning or like we hear every week, three times a week. We hear the preaching of the word and we need to lay hold on that truth that's laid out for us by these great men of God, but also in your reading as you read every day, the Bible. You read the scriptures yourself, studying these things, whether they be so. And we see many times in the New Testament the Apostle Paul talks about how we need to hold fast to the truth and to the doctrines that we've learned from him, from him and Barnabas and from the other apostles and from the other uh, disciples, as well as other preachers like Timothy um, who are teaching the same things. 
because we're not to be led away with strange and diverse doctrines. And uh, the emphasis uh, is, is on the importance of not just reading the Bible, but you've also got to believe and settle every word in your heart and es- actually establish a foundation of truth built upon the rock of Christ and just continue building your truth on top of that uh, through your reading and through good preaching. So, so if you want to turn to 2 Kings 22... See, the first step to having knowledge is having the Word of God, but it's no good having it if you don't read it. So we'll see an example of this in 2 Kings 22, starting in verse 8. And it reads, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that they have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asahiah the servant of the king, saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord." that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that is written concerning us. See, you can't know what God expects from you if you're not reading his scriptures. If you're not reading the books of the law, you're not reading the word he's given to us, which is the Bible. And we do see several times in the Bible, but this is just one example. Same thing happened, you know, when, uh, look at Nehemiah as well. They found the book and they read the book not realizing that they'd been in sin this whole time. Um, But when we read God's wisdom, we should just hear it and then choose to do it, just do what's right from then on. It's one thing to to sin in ignorance, as these people did. They didn't know the law, but when they heard the law, they were convicted and they knew they'd broken God's law. And they said, well, we need to get this right. That's why the king rent the clothes and they started, you know, at that point, just repenting to the Lord because they knew they'd sinned against the Lord. And they're no longer in ignorance to that. But if you have a Bible that isn't the King James, then you don't have his word. And you can't learn the wisdom of God from a perverted version of the Bible. See, they pervert specific doctrines, which makes it impossible to actually understand even true salvation in those Bibles. But we have the King James. That's a, that's a more sure word. And it's 100% faithful to the original text. So we believe it is perfect and without error. And wisdom begins with the Word of God. It begins with His statutes and commandments. And God's promised us we would have every word because He says we have to live by every word of God. If He didn't provide it to us, if He didn't preserve it, then He couldn't make such a commandment. So and we, we have the truth. If we have God's Word, we have the truth because Jesus is the truth. But if you have a different Bible, what you have isn't truth, it's a lie. Because even a little bit of a lie turns it into a complete lie. So, but we have the absolute truth. And we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man cometh unto the Father but by him. And we only know that because we have the truth. So if you want to turn to, uh, let's see, I'll read to you from 1 Corinthians 2. If you want to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4, it says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, that's where our wisdom should stand. It should stand in the Word of God, in the wisdom of God, and not with enticing men, enticing words of men and the wisdom of men. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. It says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, 
yea, the deep things of God. So again, we can know these things because we have that Spirit of God. Verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.12 Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So He freely gives us His knowledge, His wisdom, His understanding. He gives it to us through His Spirit, which when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you receive that Spirit, that earnest of our inheritance. It says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the wisdom of the world, it's foolishness with God. The Bible is truth, and we do have absolute truth. See, the world and their foolishness says that absolute truth doesn't exist. Truth is fluid to them. They can change the truth at any time. We have absolute truth, and the truth never changes because God never changes. And uh, even the fools, they can take the truth of God and they can turn it into a lie. Proverbs 15.2 says, The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools pour, poureth out foolishness. See, they can only pour out foolishness. They don't have the wisdom of God. They don't have true wisdom. See, and soul winning, that's God's plan for pe- seeing people saved. Preaching the gospel boldly, opening your mouth and preaching the gospel and also being sent out by a local church. This is what God's commanded for how, you know, how the world is going to be reached with the gospel. But even Bible college, that's the wisdom of man, and that's why it doesn't work. You know, just think how much corruption comes out of those places, even places like Hillsong. You know, how much corruption comes out of places like that? How many false prophets? But they've got their Bible degree. It's not what God ordained. See, what God ordained, the wisdom of God, is the local New Testament church. They're independent and they train and they send out men to start churches. They judge a man's character and worthiness to hold that prominent position, which is leading and teaching God's people. That's a pretty important position. See, we judge that they meet the requirements that God laid out in books like Timothy and Titus. So we judge those men that are sent out, but You'd notice I said men. See, women preachers are not of God. And it's the foolish wisdom of man that lets women usurp the authority given to men, given to the local church. But God forbids that in the church. So you're there in 1 Timothy 2. Look at verse 11. It says, Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. See, God didn't ordain women preachers, but the world's wisdom will tell you that, yeah, we can have women preachers. Well, God forbids it, and this church forbids it, for that very reason, because we do things the Lord's way. And feminism is another one of those things that the world looks at. It's the wisdom of man. See, God made the woman to be a helpmeet for the man. Now, she's no less valuable, absolutely not. You know, they're all, we're all equal in value, but it's a different authority. See, she's always under her father's authority or her husband's authority, or if she's a widow taken care of by the church, then she's under the church's authority. But what the world wants to do through feminism is divide families. They want the women away from their husbands, not having children, and uh, when God's wisdom is that they should be keepers at home, that they should have, you know, love their husbands, and their husbands love them, and they have children, and they start families. This is what God's ordained. This is the wisdom of God, and it works. It works better than anything the world ever, ever can come up with. Now, Colossians 3.18 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Titus 2.3 says, The aged women likewise that they be in good behaviour, as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now that's a very important role 
that women have to raise the children. See, the husband's out working. He's providing financially for the family. But actually raising the children, the new generation, such an important role that women play. And God's ordained women for that role. But when you take women out of that role, this is why the world is so messed up. See, when you listen to the wisdom of God and do things His way, the Word of God causes the Lord to be glorified. When you do things contrary to His wisdom, according to your own or the world's wisdom, then you can cause the Word of God to be blasphemed. And it brings down the name of the Lord, His church, and His people in the eyes of the world. See, it takes wisdom to use knowledge correctly. I'll get you to turn to to Proverbs 25, where Proverbs 15, 7 says, The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. Proverbs 26, 7 says, The legs of the lame are not equal, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. Proverbs 26, verse 9 says, As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. See, the fool can't even understand or use parables correctly. And they often end up twisting them and teaching even the opposite of what they're saying. And we've all heard the strange things people say about the parables in the New Testament or some of the stories that happen in the Bible. But their interpretations make no sense if you actually understand what the parable's about. But see, we're not fools. We have the Spirit of God, which gives us, us all understanding if we read and seek His Word um, in the King James Bible, which is something we're commanded to do. See, we see the world's wisdom is to hate your enemies and take vengeance on them yourselves. Joel there in Proverbs 25, verse 21, says, If an enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if you be thirsty... Give him water to drink, for thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. See, God's wisdom is to love our enemies and to leave vengeance up to him, because vengeance belongs to the Lord. And again, you'll see that people use parables to teach you lies from the Bible because they don't understand them. But that's something we need to be aware of, is you need to know what the parables are really teaching. And with the Spirit of God, you can know. You seek out the things of God and he'll lead you to all truth. But these people out there will try and lie to you and say the Bible says this, the Bible says that. When you know that it doesn't say that at all and try and teach you about who God is. They don't know who God is. They can never know who God is. They're not known of God, but we are. Now Luke 8 verse 9 says, And his, disciple, his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. See, to the world, the Lord was teaching in parables, but the, to the disciples and us, he teaches all things plainly, because we are to understand. We have that spirit which helps us to understand. They can't truly really understand these sayings because they don't have the Spirit of God. Though I believe sometimes the Lord will allow some people to understand the gospel but not believe it because that's a form of torment for those people who have rejected him. And I'm not sure, but I know it's out there because we've encountered people like that who can tell you exactly they know how to get saved but they just cannot believe. So maybe that is how God chooses to torment them. But the world just can't fundamentally understand the things like the age of the earth, the creation and the things of God. See, they create methods and theories that are built on a faulty premise. See, their premise is there is no God, there is no creator, and the Bible's a work of fiction, it's stories and myths. And of course, because of that, they can't understand the truth of God's creation because you have to believe the record that he's given us. And they reject the record. See, they believe we're animals. And when you're, when you're wrong about basic concepts such as the age of the earth, where you believe it to be millions or billions of years old, you know, it's hard to take it seriously. See, we know, according to the Bible, if you believe the Bible, which of course we do here, <laughs> the earth was created in six literal 24-hour periods, six days. On the seventh day, the Lord rested. 
So we know that to be true. But they'll never understand this earth. They don't understand why they're here. They don't understand why it exists. And they don't understand what happens after they die. Because these things are all understood by faith. They don't have faith. But we have faith through the word of God, the wisdom of God and his spirit. And that's how we know. We'll get you to turn to John chapter 16. We'll be in John and Mark. And I'll read to you from Colossians chapter 1 verse 14. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Of course, talking of Jesus Christ. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Nothing consists, nothing exists without God. Nothing exists without Jesus Christ. And everything exists for him and by him. See, God's wisdom tells us we're created for his pleasure. This earth was created for man to inhabit, to have dominion over all creatures. We're not animals, but we're men made in the image of God. That's what the Bible teaches. And the reason we're here is for him. We're here to believe on him, to worship him in truth. And you believe on him, you become a child of God who lives on the earth in the descended heavenly Jerusalem after the rapture. Or if you don't believe you're cast into the lake of fire to be tormented forever and ever. That's the truth and that's the reality. That's the wisdom of God though. The world can't understand, but you can understand. And God expects us to understand. So you're there in John 16, look at verse 12. John 16, 12. He says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Again, this is speaking of the Holy Ghost, which indwells all of us. Um, That he teaches us all things, he guides us into all truth. And he glorifies Christ. This is how you know the wisdom of God, the truth, will always glorify Christ. If it doesn't glorify Christ, it's not the truth. And God isn't secretive about who he is to his own children. But he's not known to the world. See, when you preach the gospel, you can give a picture of who God is to the world. But without his spirit, they can never truly know him. They can never understand who he is and why he does the things the way he does. But to us, he's revealed those deep things of God. John 8, verse 26 says, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. See, there are so many examples of people having a carnal understanding of spiritual things. All through the New Testament, Christ is coming across people He's speaking to them spiritual truths and they just don't understand them because they haven't uh, understood the things of the Spirit of God. Um, And yeah, we're going to look at a couple more examples here. Um, John 8 is a great example. Pastors just preach through that. So we're not going through (laughs) through a lot of that. In John 8, 56, it says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So again, Christ, one, he exists outside of time, but two, Moses is in heaven. And he rejoiced to see the day, oh sorry, Abraham, it's what Moses, Abraham, all the Old Testament saints were in heaven. I bet they were all rejoicing at the day the Lord was born on this earth to come and die for all our sins. 
So they all witnessed that. But they didn't understand that he was speaking, of course. You know, they believed that they were all dead, that Moses, Abraham, David were all dead. But God is not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. None of the Old Testament saints who believed in the Lord were dead. They're all alive even today. But you've also got other foolish doctrines like people who believe that the angels are married to women and created giants. And it is out there. Some people do believe that. But they're lacking understanding the truth of the Bible. See, this is a carnal understanding of spiritual things. The Bible teaches in Mark 12. That there's actually a parable or story they come up with. There's a woman has seven husbands whose husband, after they all die, whose husband are they in the resurrection? So in verse 23, Mark 12, it says, In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do you not therefore err, because you know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? Again, these people are ignorant. Um, whether willfully or otherwise, they don't know the Scriptures. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead, they that rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, how in the bush God spoke unto him, saying, I'm the God of the Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. See, angels don't take wives. They don't marry. And they didn't create angel, angel-human hybrids in Genesis 6, and that's not even what Genesis 6 says. It's so far from the truth. But these are the kind of foolish doctrines that people come up with uh, when they don't understand the things of the Spirit of God. And he says, you should understand the Scriptures. The Scriptures do teach that that's, you know, teach against this. But there are plenty of other examples too. If you want to turn to John chapter 3, we'll look at Nicodemus, but first I'll just point out a, another example. John chapter 4, verse 13 So Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Again, she didn't understand Christ was speaking of everlasting life. She's speaking of that fountain of waters, the Holy Ghost, which indwells you, and that's that's a fountain of water that's inside all of us. She didn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. She's thinking carnally. And again, this is the wisdom of the world. This is how the world thinks when they don't understand um, spiritual things. And we see this in John chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So we know that we receive the earnest of our inheritance, that Holy Spirit of promise, the moment we believe. And so Christ is speaking of these things, but, you know, they they don't understand this. So they think, oh, you know, I... If you're saying that I don't have to come back to the well every day and get water, that's not what he's saying at all. But that's why the world just shows the world can't understand the spiritual things of God without the Spirit. It's the Spirit that guides us into all truth. We'll look at uh, John chapter 3, starting in verse 1, the story of Nicodemus. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came by Jesus to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You can just see he doesn't understand what Jesus is saying here. Jesus explains further. He says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, 
and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And down to verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? See, both in John 7 and John 3, as well, uh, we see that it should have been known. The scriptures do speak of these things. These men should have known, and yet they didn't understand. He's saying, look, you know, you're a master of Israel, and you don't even understand these concepts that are actually taught in scripture. And this is Christ saying there's an expectation that people would know, thank you, that people would know what the scripture says. See, there's, there's no hiding these truths, but it, even when people are ignorant of the truth, either lacking understanding or not having read, they didn't know the truth. But Jesus took the time to explain it plainly. See, when they were genuine seekers of God, if you genuinely seek the truth, you will find the truth. God will reveal it to you. See, he's not willing that any should perish. So if you're look, truly looking to be saved, God will reveal it to you. If you're truly looking for the deep things of God, the hidden secrets of God, then God will reveal them to you through his spirit. He's promised that to us. And if you want truth, then look no further than the King James Bible. That's where you're going to find all truth. So now we're going to look at a couple of men who did have the wisdom of God. So there's Job. If you want to turn to Job chapter 12. Job was a man well acquainted with who God is. And he understood his statutes and judgments. So we look at Job chapter 12 verse 1. It says, And Job answered and said, No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not such things as these? So these are Job's friends. And he's speaking to them. Well, they're supposed to be his friends. <laughs> they certainly didn't treat him like a very good friend. But they're saying they think they have all wisdom. And when they die, all wisdom is going to die with them. But see, we know that Job has the wisdom of God. Job, uh, you know, what Job says is the truth. Uh, go down to verse 9 in Job chapter 12. It says, Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind? Doth not the ear try words, and the mouth taste his meat? With the ancient is wisdom, and in length of days understanding. With him is wisdom and strength. He hath counsel and understanding. Down to verse 16. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leadeth counsel as a way spoiled and maketh the judges fools. See, the Lord has all power. Nothing escapes God. We know that. And those who think they're wise, um, the Lord can make them fools. And he absolutely does. See, never forget, the Lord sees all and knows all. He knows the hearts of men. And that's why we can safely leave things in his hands. That's why it says vengeance belongs unto him. We just leave it up to him because we know that nothing gets by him. And wisdom is when we know our place. You know, when God says to, to not do something, we don't do it. We don't involve ourselves in the Lord's business. It's his business when it comes to vengeance and things like that, raising people up and abasing them. That's the Lord's business. We don't need to go after them. That's why he says to love our enemies not to hate them and to take vengeance ourselves on them because the Lord will deal with them. That's his business. See, we know our limits and we need to let the Lord do what he does without our interference. In the same chapter, uh, verse 24, he taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. They grope in the dark without light. And he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. See, these are great truths we can learn about the Lord. And it just allows us to trust him even more, to give things over that we would want to take care of ourselves. So we'll look at another man too. Uh, turn to Daniel chapter 2. But we can find such wisdom and hidden truths. 
but you can't find them without reading the scriptures. You have to read the word of God in order to find and understand the word of God. In 1 Corinthians 2.10, it says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And it's important to understand who God is. And God's not hiding himself from us, but we have to, the Spirit searches all things and we need to read the Bible to search those hidden truths about God and who he is. Now it says the deceiver and the deceived are his, and with the Lord is wisdom and strength. See, David wrote many psalms about the exact same thing. He's somebody else who knew the Lord. He gave us knowledge of who God is and what he does. But in Daniel chapter 2, verse 19, now there was a, a dream revealed to Nebuchadnezzar and um, the secret of that dream was revealed to Daniel by the Lord. Verse 19 says, Then was that secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to, the, to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in darkness and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. See, Daniel trusted the Lord, and the wisdom that Daniel had in front of the king, that was the Lord's wisdom. It was wisdom that came from God. And it's God who elevates the faithful servant to the position in front of all kings, the wisest men, uh, the wisest men that, uh, that the king had could not, his, his sorcerers could not, you know, interpret the dream, but Daniel could interpret the dream by the wisdom and, and power of God. And it's God who elevated Daniel up to that position. Um, we've got stories as well of, um, you know, in the Old Testament, how God elevated, um, it was it uh, in Egypt, it was it Joshua or Joseph? Joseph, in Egypt, he elevated him to second in command, basically. Uh, it's the Lord who exalts and it's the Lord who brings down. And uh, the Lord can do the same for us. See, if we humble ourselves, it says if you humble yourselves, he will lift you up. If we humble ourselves before the Lord, then he can lift us up in the eyes of kings. But if you're prideful and you lift yourself up, then the Lord can bring you low and abase you. So wisdom's also tied to humility. But as his son, I want to know as much about God as possible. See, the knowledge of God is given to us through the reading of his word and spending time with him, meditating on his word. And the wisdom of God is revealed through the Holy Ghost, which indwells every believer. And we should be people like Job and Daniel, who are known for our knowledge and wisdom and understanding of the Lord. So even when, even what we can learn from the world, you know, nothing, none of that even comes close to what we can learn through the word of God. The world can't teach us anything of real value. Like you can learn how to survive the world, but outside of that, <laughs> they can't teach you anything. But uh, one thing we do learn um, is that the world is full of foolishness and the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. See, they scoff and mock at the wisdom of God. Uh, in 2 Peter 2, it says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of, evil spoken of. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. 1 Timothy 6.3 If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, 
perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. See, the world truly hates truth. And they create their own truth, which is just, it's a lie. It's just cope. God created the earth and everything in it. He created the heavens as well. They hate the truth that God created male and female. They want to come up with a thousand different variations, but God created male and female. They hate the truth that there's heaven and hell. They hate the truth that they will go to hell for not believing in the Son of God. They hate that Jesus paid for all their sins. They want to work the, their way to heaven. They hate that it's a free gift. They hate because Jesus is truth. And they hate us because we're children of God. And he says, no servant is above his master. If they hated me, they'll hate you. But those who seek truth, eventually they'll be faced with the gospel and they'll, they'll believe the truth and be saved. Proverbs 19.8 says, He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. And of course, we see those who resist the truth. We just read about some of those. Um, in 2 Timothy 3, 9, it says, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. We heard a sermon about that this morning. Their folly has been made manifest. You know, the, the wicked uh, Hillsong Church. But the wisdom of God, which we have access to, it's superior in every single way. See, God's ways are above our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. The truth will always prevail because God is truth and God doesn't lose. See, God's always in control. There's nothing that happens to you that takes him by surprise. And it's important that we remember that. See, people can lie, but you can spot their lies because you know the truth. But the Lord knows all and he will shut the mouths of those who lie against him. 1 John 2.21 says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. See, the world tells you there's no Christ. It tells you there's no coming of Christ, that there is no truth. But we do know better. See, we've all put our faith in the Son of God. We've received that spirit that witnesses with our spirit that we're the children of God. I know for a fact, I, I, like there's no doubt at all. You can't convince me otherwise. I am a child of God. His spirit has testified with my spirit that I am a son of God. And there's just no way that they can lie to me and convince me otherwise. And this is what they don't understand. They don't understand how our faith is so strong. How it's not even, at this point it's not even faith. I just know. I just know for a fact. But see, the fool in his heart, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. And they can mock God, but God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Proverbs 23, 9 says, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. See, fools hate wisdom. They love the wisdom of the world, but they hate true godly wisdom. And they'll even mock you for believing the word of God. Fools make a mock at sin. But that's why correcting them is impossible. See, if a man doesn't hear the truth, he's not worthy of truth. And one saying you will find countless times in the New Testament is, He that hath an ear, let him hear. See, Jesus didn't want to talk to people who weren't interested. He didn't want to talk to people who were going to resist the truth. He wanted to speak to people who actually have an ear to listen to the truth of God's word. It also says, don't cast your pearls before swine. See, a fool, a scorner, a scoffer, they're only going to waste your time. They don't want the truth, and they've deceived themselves. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10, it says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie that they might all be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. See, why are we 
chosen to salvation because we believe the truth. That's why. And in this context, it's about the Antichrist who does lying wonders to deceive all those who believe not. But there are also those who choose not to believe on the Lord who can be given over to the deception, you know, to, rather than to believe in the truth. See, people can be damned before they even die. They're called reprobate. And it's rejected of God. But that's what the wisdom of the world leads to. Whereas the wisdom of God leads to Christ and his perfect gift of salvation. And that's why we preach that gift to whosoever has an ear to hear. See, they that have an ear to hear, let him hear the words of life. So there's one more point as I wrap it up here. But this is the importance of teaching wisdom to your children. See, you need to teach wisdom to your children if you don't want them to fail. And these are principles that we all need to live by to help us succeed. But God wants his children, just as you want your children, to be wise and strong. Proverbs 22.6 says, uh, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 23.22 says, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. So this is why your parents uh, want you to be wise, because a wise son brings joy to the parents. You know, when the children listen to the instruction of the parents uh, and, and are wise, then that brings great joy. It says, thy father and thy mother shall be glad. Proverbs 13, 13 says, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. But he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. See, we shouldn't despise God's word, but we should love his commandments and statutes. And we should treat it as the precious life-giving fountain of wisdom and knowledge that, that the word truly is. To read it, but also love it and seek it out as it's more precious than gold or silver or precious stones. And the children especially should, you should read it to your children when they're young, even before they fully understand. Just read the Bible to your children, teach them the things of God. Because we saw with Moses that even though he was separated uh, and raised by Pharaoh, um, that he still held on everything that his mother taught him in the first couple of years as she was feeding him. Proverbs 14, 18 says, The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. See, you don't want to be simple. You especially don't want to be simple regarding the things of God. But you want to have understanding and know the things of God. You want to know the law of the Lord. You want to know his statutes. Because it says they make wise the simple. We're not to be simple, we're to be wise. And foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. See, children are foolish, and foolishness is fun to children. But chastening with instruction is what brings them wisdom. This is what the Bible teaches. The reproof mixed with the rod of correction. It says, then they can depart from foolishness and become wise, seeking knowledge with the things of God and walking uprightly. See, the world's even against spanking. It's against using the rod of correction. And it's even illegal in some countries. And yet that's the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of God says that you... Uh, well, I'll read to you Proverbs 23, 13. It says, Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Like that's a command of God to your parents. That they need to both reprove you with words but also correct you with the rod. It says, My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reins shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. See, again, your parents are going to rejoice when they see that you're full of wisdom. They see that you've grown up, you love the Lord, and you're full of the wisdom of God. That's going to bring joy to your parents. 
And uh, parents want their children to do better than they did, to not make the same mistakes they have. That's why they may end up correcting you. Um, you know, sorry, just one sec. So yeah, that's why your parents uh, will correct you because they see you making mistakes and being unwise and they want to bring you back to wisdom. That's why reproof and correction are a part of that. And God chastens us because he loves us. Your parents chasten you because they love you. And I know we know that, but it's just important to always remember that. See, the Bible commands them to beat the foolishness out with the rod of correction what the Bible teaches, but it also entails parents explaining why they're chastening. That's the reproof. But it says you chasten them early and you drive it far from them. Proverbs 17.10 says, A reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. So you want to be the wise man, that when your parents sit you down and tell you something, that you do it. Because if you don't, you may end up like that foolish man who requires a hundred stripes. Now that's a hundred whips to the back. Now I'm not saying your parents will do that, but this is what it's saying. It's rather than being stubborn and requiring a hundred stripes, you know, why don't you take the reproof when your parents say it to you? And the one, it shows wisdom when you do that, that yes, I can be corrected, that my parents can guide me, you know, a lot easier. Uh, Proverbs 29.1 says that he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. See, the guy who doesn't listen to the reproof who requires a hundred stripes, the Lord says that he may just be destroyed because he refuses to listen to the Lord. And this is the thing, when your parents are chasing you, it's not just your parents chasing you, but also it's a picture of the Lord, Lord's chastisement, because even as adults, we get chastened to the Lord the same way children get chased into their parents. And that's why it's important to learn that early on, that um, you, don't want, you don't want to harden your neck to the things of God, to the law of the Lord, um, and be contrary to his laws. Don't harden your heart to sin. And don't be stiff-necked towards God. But be corrected with words, otherwise you will be corrected with the rod. See, God gives us a choice. In Psalm 32, verse 8, He says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near under thee. See, when a horse goes out of the way, it gets whipped to bring it back into line. It has a bridle to guide it. But the Lord wants to guide us gently with his eyes. See, he just wants to reprove us and say, hey, Stop that. Why don't you do this instead? And we need to hearken to the Lord when he says that. We need to hearken to our parents when they say that too. But if we're stubborn, we might get the whip like the horse and the mule. Proverbs 17, 21 says, He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. So this is the opposite of we're seeing that when, when a son is wise, he brings joy to his parents. But when a son is a fool, the father hath no joy and the mother is bitter. See, it applies to children, but also to us adults as well. Because the chastening of children, that's just a picture of the chastening the Lord does to us. And the purpose is the same, it's to drive foolishness from us, that we can partake of the Lord's righteousness. So I'll just read from Hebrews 12. Again, we're very familiar with this passage. Hebrews 12, 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as, dealeth with, you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection under the Father of spirits and live? 
For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, speaking of God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. See, it's just a couple more verses here. Proverbs 19.25 about chastening with the rod. To smite a scorner and the simple will beware and reprove one that hath understanding and he will understand knowledge. So again, you know, you either want to be smitten or do you want to understand uh, and receive it through reproof? Do you want to be told off or do you want to be hit? Basically, <laughs> it's the choice we have. And it's the same choice with God. Do we want to listen to when God tells us off? When you hear preaching and it convicts you and you choose not to do anything about it, you harden your neck to it, and God might have to bring a rod next time. It's, we all need to be very careful with this. See, it says, Judgments are prepared for scorners and stripes for the back of fools. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. So even we can be fools at times. And the correction of the, but the correction of the Lord is what drives it far from us. And he wants us to be wise and not fools. So we go through the chasing of the Lord. We just have to remember these things. God loves us and it's for our own good that he chastens us. We suffer because we need to suffer. And our pride must be brought down. We all have pride. We've all got times where we're in pride and our pride has to be brought down. If you can't humble yourself, if we can't humble ourselves, then we will be brought down and he'll bring us down with the rod. If we go far from the Lord, he will correct our path. It's just a part of being born of God. Because it says all are partakers. If you don't partake of his chastisement, you're not a son, you're a bastard. And you've got worse things to look forward to, hell. So don't feel bad when the Lord chastens you, but rejoice that he loves you and that you're his. Because that's more important than anything. So we'll finish off with the last verse, Proverbs 28, 26. It says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. So walk wisely, don't trust in your own heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Just trust in the Lord, read, read the Lord's word and trust in the wisdom of God. So let's pray.